who would eventually be the names by which the land of Israel would be divided up into. And uh, today we're on number three. And uh, just as a hint, this should give it away who I'm speaking about. Levi. So Levi. Levi is the name of our talk today. Levi, the third son of Jacob. Um, like his older brother Reuben and Simeon, he was also the son of the older sister that Jacob married, Leah. Uh, so we're going to look at Levi today and we're going to work out, as we're going to be doing through all these talks in this series, we're going to be looking at the outworking of the prophecies Jacob made over them before he died. Prophecies, some good, some bad. There's almost blessings and curses here among these prophecies. Let's pray before we read God's word. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and mercy, and we pray that as uh, I read your word, as I speak from it, Lord, that you will touch our hearts, touch each of our hearts today, Lord. May we hear your voice to us, the voice of your Holy Spirit. I just ask that you will give me a wisdom which is certainly not my own, that is from on high as I preach, and we just pray that you will transform us as we come under your authority. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've got a church Bible, it's page 44, and it's Genesis chapter 49, which is going to be our stock reference throughout this series. Genesis chapter 49. And today we're going to read verses 1 and 2 and 5 to 7, just like we did two weeks ago in the verse of Sinai. Then Jacob called together all his sons and said, Gather around me, and I will tell you what will happen to each of you in the days to come. Come and listen, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. In verse 5, Simeon and Levi are two of kind. Their weapons are instruments of violence. May I never join in their meetings. May I never be a party to their plans. For in their anger they murdered men, and they crippled oxen just for sport. A curse on their anger, for it is fierce. A curse on their wrath, for it is cruel. I will scatter them among the descendants of Jacob. I will disperse them throughout Israel. And of course, we looked at two weeks ago, the reason for this curse, this reason for this very harsh prophecy, is that Simeon and Levi, in Genesis 34, decided to kill the residents of pretty much the entire town in retribution uh, for the honour of their sister, Dino. And Dino had been raped by a man of the Highlight tribe, and of course, rape is a horrendous crime. There's many bones about it. It's a horrendous crime which needs to be punished, there needs to be retribution. But I think killing tens or even hundreds of people is perhaps a little bit disproportionate, even for such a crime. But that is what Simeon and Levi did. And even in the, the, the times that they lived in, where people would often take retribution three or four times, and you end up with escalating blood feuds. What they did was disproportionate and shocking, even for the people of their time. And that sort of disproportionate revenge is why I believe that God wisely gave through the law of Moses those words, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Equal justice. You do something and you pay proportionately for it. Simeon and Levi did not act proportionately. Their father Jacob was angry, and I believe God was angry as well. I also believe that if Simeon and Levi had been the only ones who abducted their half brother Joseph, Joseph would be dead. No question, they would kill him. But some of the more merciful other brothers managed to get him at least into slavery, gave him at least another chance. Simeon and Levi would just kill him with no conscience whatsoever. And so they get harshly judged for this, and they get yoked together, effectively, in this, what might be a curse from their father, who doesn't seem to want any part of them. If we can have a look at the map of Israel, thank you. Uh, we can have a look at the map of, that of Israel, when the Jews eventually conquered the land, and they uh, owned it uh, under Jacob, uh, sorry, under Joshua, and further through, you'll notice that Simeon, it's just an area within Judah, and very quickly the land of Simeon, or the territory of Simeon, got consumed by Judah, and the people got dispersed 
among Judah and also the other tribes. The Simeons have effectively disappeared. And if you also look at that map, I know the wording is quite small, but if you look closely and you look for Levi, you will not see it there at all. The prophecy was fulfilled. Both of those tribes were scattered among the peoples of the land. But that is where the similarity between the between the outcome for Simeon and Levi ends. Because the outcomes of them are ultimately are very, very different. Now, two weeks ago I mentioned that Simeon was the more culpable one. He was the older brother and probably the ringleader. Doesn't let Levi up, but less culpable as the young one who probably followed his older brother. But the real thing that changes is the fact that when there's a curse in the Bible, it can always be removed, revoked. There's always a means by which, a hope by which these things can come to an end. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, in the unlikely, maybe, account here of the Ten Commandments being given, we read this. This is the second commandment, which is actually very appropriate for what happens later on. Deuteronomy 5, 8 to 10. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. And you might be born into a family or situation where you feel cursed, where you feel that there is a generational nightmare in your family. It could be all sorts of things. It could be hereditary disease. It could be financial ruin and mismanagement. It could be addictions. It could be a propensity to violence. It could be marriage breakup, divorce, infidelity. It could be all sorts of different things. It could be character failings, it could be other things as well. And that might just be unbelief in God. Well, if I say just, that's pretty the biggest one of all, but it might be that. And you may feel that all you can do is just keep on with this cycle of madness, as it were, cycle of destruction. But there's hope here, right in Deuteronomy chapter 5, that a godly man or woman and break those curses. <coughs> and especially the homegrown curses. I'm going, to, I'm going to be addicted because my father is, or my mother is. Oh, I'm going to be violent because my father or mother or grandfather is. Oh, I'm going to, my marriage is going to fail because it's happened in previous generations. That's not need to continue. We can change the narrative. And it's not we can change the narrative, it's God can, not us. But we need to show the faith. I mean, to ask him for the strength to change those patterns. But most importantly, if, we, if you were brought up in a non Christian home and you have come to the Lord, that is a blessing for your family indeed. Because you're given the opportunity for salvation and faith. Now, no parent can force their children to the kingdom of heaven. It's an individual choice. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot better choice if the parents are praying for them and showing them a godly example. So if you feel that there's a there's a pattern of unbelief in your family or bad character or whatever it might be, don't despair. But ask God to change the narrative. Ultimately, what do we want most want? To be safe in his arms forever lost in life. That's the most important one. But these other things can change as well. So let's look at the outworking of what eventually changed. You meant that the outcome for Levi's family was different from that of Simeon's. Well, it starts in, Gen in Exodus chapter 2, which is only three chapters on from Genesis 49. It's about 400 years old. It's a big gap here. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. This is in the midst of the Pharaoh of Egypt enslaving the Jews and actually ordering a genocide of all the baby boys of the Jews. Exodus 2 verse 1. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. 
She saw that he was a special baby who kept him hidden for three months. The rest is history. That baby was saved and his name was Moses. And Moses is one of the most incredible people in the Bible. One of the most faithful men of God that we see in the Bible. Not perfect. There's only one character in the Bible who's perfect. Not perfect. But, and yet, honouring God in his life. A great leader of his people who led his people the right way. A man about whom it was said he spoke to God like a friend. What a relationship he had with God. And I think it was Moses' faithfulness that started to change the narrative for the whole tribe of Levi. That's the first uh, step. The second step is what happened after the Jews were released from slavery in Egypt and Moses went up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He was gone for a long time and some of the people evidently decided they didn't want to follow Moses anymore, they didn't want to follow God anymore, and they wanted to go their own way. And so they made an idol of a golden calf, and they, even worse, they made, I think they coerced Moses' poor old brother Aaron into making this for them. And their excuses are, Moses is dead, we've got to choose another way. They didn't know that, it had been gone a long time. But they decided to do these things. And not, not, it wasn't just the idolatry, it was also the immorality, it's like an orgy that they had. It was terrible. They actually made them completely away from God. In Exodus 32, verse 25, Moses comes down in the midst of this. And as you can imagine, he's not very really impressed. Exodus 32, 25. Moses saw that Aaron had let the people go completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and shouted, all of you who are on the north side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each of you take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends and neighbours. The Levites obeyed Moses' command, and about 3,000 people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him, even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you have earned a blessing. And this seems to have been a turning point for the Levites. Now you might say, hey, how's that what they did? How's that better than what, than what Levi had done, their forefather originally, with him and Simeon, killing all those people? How's this better? This is fine. This is extreme fine. This is awful. And to our ears today, it is. But I think we do need to look at the context of what was going on here. The Jews were still enslaved in Egypt. God chose a deliverer to get them out, Moses. These people had seen God consistently and almost continuously do amazing signs and wonders. Physical signs, supernatural signs and wonders, the ten plagues in Egypt. And if they weren't amazing enough, horrible enough for ten plagues. Most of those plagues only affected the Egyptians, they didn't affect the Jews. So we think, oh, it could have been some fluke of nature. Well, none of it's only affecting them and not them. That's ridiculous. Then, when Pharaoh sent them out of Egypt and sent them away, and then changed his mind and sent his army after them to kill them, the Red Sea's in their way, the sea parts, and they go to the and if that wasn't enough, once they were sent over to the other side and Pharaoh's army in the middle of the sea, the waves washed over them and Pharaoh's army is destroyed. If that's not enough, God is guiding them, leading them, protecting them as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Then there's all the signs and wonders on Mount Sinai itself, the lightning, the fire, the thunder, the voice from heaven. Then we've got the fact that they are provided for with manna and quail in the desert. And they're getting water from a dry rock, enough for all of them. It's a huge number of people. And yet these guys, the first opportunity to say, we don't want to God, we all worship an idol. It's a pretty bad thing to do, isn't it? I know it sounds like horrendous violence, but where God's power runs, there is often judgment as well. God's holiness means judgment as well. 
on these things. So I think in the context, there's no way those people could continue to be the people of God. They have turned their backs on him utterly at the first track. I mean, how could you? You've seen God. It's so obvious who he is. Look at how the Pharisees were called for when Jesus was on them. And they purposefully and willfully chose to reject him and disbelieve in him. And if you, if you think this sort of judgment is just for the Old Testament, well, in Genesis chapter 5, there's a couple called Ananias. Sorry, Genesis. In Acts chapter 5, there's a couple called Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira saw the works of God in him in great power. They saw the great wonders of Pentecost. They saw healings. They saw deliverances. They probably saw people raised from the dead. And they saw the speaking in tongues of prophecy and all manner of other spiritual gifts in evidence. And the great growth of the church was almost nothing. And yet they decided that they would lie to the Holy Spirit and deceive him and be duplicitous. And in Acts chapter 5, it tells us that Peter, the apostle, had a word of knowledge from God. These guys are not being honest. And Peter actually says to them, This is going to go bad for you. And what happens to them? They drop dead. It's scary. That's a new covenant. Now, can I say, which is comforting for us today, Peter and the other apostles didn't lay a hand on him. It was a direct judgment of God. You know, we are not called to lay a hand to people. Thank God we are. You know, but, we, but, but we are called, we are called, um, called to say a sin to sin. You know, if something's wrong, we've got to call it out. We have to be right before God. As I say, when God comes in great power, His holiness is evident. There is also the potential for judgment. And so when we pray for revival, who prays for revival here? Probably most of us at some point pray for revival. You have to watch out. Make sure you're prepared for revival. Make sure you're in the right place for revival. Make sure that you are ready to meet with the living God. Because likewise, likewise, and if you've ever read the accounts of more recent revivals, like the one in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, there was great turning of people to God. But you know what? There was great repentance and weeping and fear of the judgment of the Lord. People were actually crying, almost grabbing onto the altar for fear of judgment. And thank God that we are rescued by the Lord Jesus. Thank God that we are rescued for the wrath that is to come. Because there will be judgment at the end of time when Jesus comes. He will come as judge. And we take that lightly at our peril. And we in the right place, and you in the right place to meet with God in revival or face to face when you pass through this life or when he comes again. Are we in that right place? So the Levites, it does seem, did the right thing this day. Of course, they were Moses' tribe, so possibly that's why, but they wanted no part of the rebellion against God. That's the key thing here. And so the narrative changed for them. And then we see the reason why Levi is not mentioned on that, the map that was here earlier. There's no point in that. Levi's not there, but you know that he's not there. And the reason is in Numbers chapter 18. It says this Numbers 18, 23 to 25. From now on, no Israelites except priests or Levites may approach the tabernacle. If they come too near, they'll be judged guilty and die. Only the Levites may serve at the tabernacle, and they will be held responsible for any offences against it. This is a permanent law for you to be observed from generation to generation. The Levites will receive no allotment of land among the Israelites, because I have given them the Israelites' tithes, which have been presented as sacred offerings to the Lord. This will be the Levites' share, and that is why I said, they would receive no allotment of land among the Israelites. So here we see the outworking of the scattering of the Levites, the scattered actually for a good purpose, to be those who do the work of God, firstly in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and later in the temple. They're the ones who will be beneficiaries of the tithes and offerings and sacrifices. Any sacrifice not actually burnt up was for their use. And of course they didn't have land because they had work to do. They had no time to be farmers, they needed to be doing the Lord's work. So they in a special, exalted place among the people of God. And most special among them 
which the high priest family. Aaron, it seems, was forgiven for his misdemeanor, you know, which is why I believe he was absolutely coerced into this and paid the debt. I think. And Aaron, Moses' brother, became the high priest, and that became a hereditary passing down through his descendants. And the high priest was allowed into the inner room of the tabernacle, and later into the most holy place of the temple. A place so holy that it was said to be God's dwelling place on earth. A place so holy that it was said to be a copy and a shadow of God's heavenly throne room. One man, once a year, the line of Aaron, the line that led you back to Levi. What a change, what a transformation. But of course the Levites themselves were, were, were synonymous with the old covenant. A covenant for the Jews. A covenant which God made for his people uh, under Moses, the law giver. So the Levites, the, the Levites' role, I believe, was always temporary. It provided a part to play. But the Levites also, their powers were limited. Even when Aaron was there, there was someone greater than him, wasn't there? Moses. Moses, for me, is a, one of the main types of Christ in the Old Testament. He formed, he fulfills many things that Jesus came to do. He was the bearer of the covenant, the old one, Jesus or the new covenant. He was the messenger who bore the message of God, so did Jesus. He was the one that was effectively the go between. People said, no, 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 don't let God speak to us, Lord, we want you to speak on our behalf. And as I said before, a man who spoke to God like a friend. Moses was a type of who brought the people as close as they could get to, 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 to God. Aaron, in a sense, is a type of Christ as well. Slightly so love, but he's there as the high priest, interceding for the people, making sacrifices on their behalf, coming before a holy God. And they all point to someone far greater. They point to someone who had come, not the tribe of Levi, but I mean, if you look at his genealogies, the tribe of Judah, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks' time. But when Jesus came, when he was born as a baby, and just a toddler, the wise men came. The wise men came bearing gifts. Gifts which were very expensive, very useful, when they had to flee to Egypt to escape from King Herod, uh, for Joseph and Mary. But those gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh, gold for a king. Myrrh reminds us that, uh, used to embalm a dead body, reminds us that Jesus would be a sacrifice. And incense, there's two looks at incense. Firstly, incense is a friend of offering before God, speaking of Jesus' divinity. But it's also offered by a priest, speaking of Jesus' role as our great high priest. But how could Jesus be our high priest? He's not even a Levi, let alone Aaron's descendant. Jesus has this authority as a priest because he's perfect. Simple as that. He's perfect. Because he's perfect, he can come, even though he was a human being for 33 or so years, right into the presence of God. And it's why that as holy as the temple was, I would love to have seen it. I would love to have seen the temple. As amazing as the temple must have been, as a place of worship of God, as an awesome place, the body of Jesus is far more holy. In John chapter 2, Jesus. Uh, threw the tables over of the people in the temple. He was angry at their disrespect for God's place. And when he was challenged about this by the Pharisees and chief priests and teachers of the law, Jesus says this, verse 19 of John 2, All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He wasn't talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about his own body, which would be crucified, but then he would rise gloriously from the dead. That body that Jesus humbled himself to be born into, that body bore the holiness and absolute character of a perfect God. And so Jesus' physical body was far more holy than the temple could ever be. Because he got sinners going, don't you? Because Jesus is perfect with the perfection we see. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, the writer to the Hebrews actually tells us that although the Levites had an awesome responsibility, particularly the sons of Aaron. 
there is a greater priestly order. And in Hebrews 7, the writer actually quotes from David, Jesus' own ancestor, from Psalm 110. This doesn't work with glasses very well, does it? Um, from Psalm 110, verse 4. He says this, The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow, and you are a priest forever. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now David was writing that a thousand years before Jesus, King David. And he was writing, I believe, under the absolute influence of the Holy Spirit, prophetically. Speaking of what he did not understand, but speaking about an incredible truth. That Jesus would be of a high priestly order which is eternal. His sacrifice would be eternal and it would be all sufficient. This shadowy figure, Melchizedek, is someone who we actually meet in the very earliest chapters of the Bible. And Melchizedek actually appeared to Levi's great grandfather, Abraham, or Abraham as he was known then. And in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham was coming back from winning a great battle to save his nephew, ostensibly. And in Genesis 14, which is page 12, if you want to look it up, page 12 of the Bible, Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, it says this, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God most high, brought Abraham some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Now, what we know is that the people of Israel brought the Levites their tithes. The great grandfather of Levi himself brings Melchizedek a tithe. Who's the greater? Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Who's the greater? Now, Abraham is definitely greater than Levi and Aaron, but who's greater than him? Melchizedek. And it says that Melchizedek was the priest that was the king of Salem. Now, Salem became corrupted to become Jerusalem, but in the time of Abraham, there was nothing there. It was a wilderness. Mount Moriah was just in the wilderness, which was the Temple Mount. So, in a sense, Melchizedek was king of nothing, but he was also king of everything. And he points us to the one who would come 2,000 years later. In Hebrews chapter 7, it goes on to say, in Hebrews 7 verse 3, about Melchizedek, there is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. An eternal, an eternal priesthood, an eternal line, someone, I believe is divine. And then he goes on to say, very poignantly, he remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Resembling the Son of God. And so I believe that Melchizedek was none other than the appearance of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the lost of that, before he came in flesh. That Melchizedek actually saw so Abraham actually saw Christ in the shadowy figure of Melchizedek. Christ, our great high priest, our eternal high priest, with a sacrifice that meant the temple was useless. For 40 years after Jesus died on the cross, the temple remained pointless. It was eventually destroyed by the Romans, 70 years and it's never been built. Because it's not necessary. Because the living temple made the living sacrifice for himself. An eternal one which is sufficient even for you and me Gentiles today. In John 8:56, I believe Jesus alludes to this as well. He's speaking to his fellow Jews and he says this, John 8:56. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. How did Jesus know that? Well, first of all, I think he knew that Abraham would have had the faith to see him for who he was. He would have known that this was God. He would have believed him. But also, because I believe Jesus was there. He was not because he He saw Abraham's faith and his counsel to his righteousness. 
May we take on that same faith. May we remember, even as we sadly just do communion in a few moments, as we remember the wonder of Jesus once for all, all sufficient sacrifice for all people for all time. May we remember the Levites were a shadow, a copy, a, a, a shadowy uh, prelude to a greater glory, the glory that we see manifest in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.